from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. On The Brief today, Kevin Cerulli from Washington on the testimony of Gordon Sondland, the U.S. Ambassador to the EU, and from London, Therese Raphael on last night's televised debate between Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Labor leader Jeremy Corbyn. So, Kevin, we've all been watching Ambassador Sondland's testify, but it, one thing that struck me is the president's really gone after him, but was there a real smoking gun there? Because he didn't really come out and say, I heard the president say I won't do this but for that. Exactly. The, uh, Ambassador Sondland saying that there was a quote unquote quid pro quo, end quote, in his assessment, but not necessarily, according to Republican sources, providing the evidence to suggest as much. At one point, the ambassador said that uh, he, ha he said that Vice President Mike Pence had a direct conversation uh, with uh, the, the folks involved regarding this matter, and that has drawn swift rebuke coming from Vice President Pence's office. In fact, I just got a statement from his chief of staff, Mark Short, who says, quote, the vice president never had a conversation with Gordon Sondland about investigating the Bidens, Burisma Holdings, or the conditional release of financial aid to Ukraine based upon potential investigations, end quote. So obviously this comes at a time in which he is at the political center of this storm. Republicans still very much sticking by the president uh, and Democrats continuing to press ahead with this. But uh, as of now, according to my reporting, David, uh, th this testimony has not done anything to move this impeachment inquiry out of the political sphere into a risk of the president being removed from office. Yeah, and just as a lawyer, you parse the language carefully. Ambassador Sutherland said, well, I didn't think that the president actually wanted a completed investigation. I just thought he wanted an announcement of an investigation. He actually didn't have to follow through the investigation. And by the way, I didn't know that he withheld the aid because of this. I just sort of thought he might have. You know, David, I'll leave, I'll leave the legal speech to you. You're the, you're the legal expert, but here's what I can say. I spoke with one source this morning who said that this uh, testimony today, it, it, putting pause on a second for President Trump, is completely damning to Rudy Giuliani. Uh, and that Rudy Giuliani and his apparatus surrounding him and how he has negotiated with Ukraine and was operating a shadow-like State Department has really uh, called into question the former New York City mayor and the president's personal attorney and his involvement in all of this is just uh, the latest iteration of that. Yeah, I'm sure we haven't seen the last of Rudy Giuliani. Good point, Kevin. That's Kevin Cirilli, <laughs> our chief Washington correspondent, reporting from Washington. Now we're going to London, Therese Raphael. So, Therese, there was this head-to-head -head televised debate. We're sort of used to them here in the United States. I guess you're not quite as used to that in the U.K. What came out of this debate between the prime minister on the one hand and the labor leader on the other? Yeah, so it was the first head-to-head -head debate between two uh, leaders of the main parties ever in the UK. Uh, the risks were, were in some ways higher for Boris Johnson, the prime minister, as he is, was going into the debate with a substantial lead in the polls. Uh, the polls afterwards, a stat poll that was conducted by YouGov directly afterwards, showed them sort of neck and neck. Uh, to my mind, uh, Jeremy Corbyn slightly had the edge on it, simply because you know, expectations were so low for him. And he proved, um, I think, more convincing on sort of issues of trust, uh, somewhat more fleet footed on some of the the questions that put him on the on the spot however Johnson came across as more prime ministerial and as you would expect more likable and I don't think these polls these, these debates are going to make a, a, a massive difference come voters uh, decisions on December 12th we have another head-to-head -head coming up we have the manifestos which are very important in campaigns in the UK and uh, Corbyn still has an enormous gap to make up and a very radical program that is not speaking to a lot of middle-class voters and uh, many who are just simply concerned about both his position on brexit and the economy yeah Teresa, to be clear that YouGov poll is about how people thought those those two individuals did in the debate last night, not where they're going to vote, because as I understand it right now, Prime exactly. Minister Johnson has a substantial advantage in the polling in the overall election. At the same time, you and I have talked about this before, and what are the voters really going to vote based on? Is it going to be Brexit that certainly Prime Minister Boris Johnson wanted to keep going back to, or the underlying policies which Jeremy Corbyn kept emphasizing? Yeah, I mean, it was so clear in the debate that Johnson just wanted to talk about Brexit. Pretty much every question that was put to him, he had one answer, that his government would get Brexit done and that Jeremy Corbyn uh, would usher in two further referendums, one on Brexit, one on uh, Scottish independence. Jeremy Corbyn did not use the opportunity, interestingly, to uh, uh, criticize Johnson's Brexit deal. And there's plenty of grounds he could have done that on. Instead, he wanted to talk about the NHS and spending. So each of them are fighting uh, in a way their own 
own election, own separate election campaign. Uh, and, you know, at the moment, it seems to be Johnson's that is cutting through most with voters who are simply, you know, tired of three years of uncertainty and uh, debate over Brexit. Okay, thanks so very much to Bloomberg Opinion columnist Therese Raphael reporting from London. And now it's time to get that check on the markets and to see how they're reacting to all the day's top stories, if they are at all. Abigail Doolittle is here. I don't think a lot of reaction to those stories that you just discussed, but we have stocks slightly lower the first day this week where we don't have all-time highs because even though the majors finished mixed at the end of the day, putting in all-time highs during the day. So this is something new, and I think it's probably having to do with trade. Investors getting a little bit tired of the fact that we don't have this phase one deal. In fact, with uh, the Senate passing that Hong Kong bill in support of the, the protesters in Hong Kong, uh, that now coming to the House, it could suggest, and China coming back with some harsh language, it could suggest that negotiations around that phase one deal could get a little bit more difficult. And when you put that together with the idea that if it doesn't happen and those December 15th tariffs, I think 20 percent come in, that could change the economic picture. That may help to explain, though, David, why we've had this big rally in bonds, because we've had stocks making these all-time highs, but at the same time, bonds rallying, yields go lower because the Fed has said that they may possibly step back in if there's a material change. And those new tariffs on uh, December 15th, if they go into effect, really affect consumers just as we go into the holiday period, which will yes. be really damaging. Particularly. And we're supposed to hear from the House, they're going to vote on the Hong Kong bill, which could go to the, the president. It could really stop the trade negotiations. Yeah, it really could, especially because of that language coming back from China. It seems as though there could be a real logjam there. And from the standpoint of if those tariffs go into place, you're right, hitting all sorts of consumer goods right before Christmas. It's a shortened shopping period because Thanksgiving is late this year, so it would really affect two weeks there. And just from a sentiment standpoint, uh, it's not very good. And something else I'd like to bring in very quickly, the cigarette makers, they are popping oh. higher because there was that FDA breaking news. Uh, the FDA is no longer going to try to reduce nicotine, unfortunately. That's just my opinion. But unfortunately, and if you recall, the last FDA commissioner, uh, Scott Gottlieb, he had been a physician, so he had been pushing for that, but now a reversal. So we see some of these cigarette stocks uh, popping. Yeah, I mean, really a significant move in the stocks, and that's on the heels of the federal government basically back, backing off of the vaping the regulation, vaping as which well. really affected Altria a lot. Yeah, it's unfortunate. So, From my own standpoint, I hope yeah. that this shifts, but right now that is the story. Okay, Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much for the report on the markets. And now we turn to Mark Crumpton. He's here with Bloomberg First Word News. David, in Iran, anti-government protests are said to have left at least 106 people dead. That comes from Amnesty International. Thousands demonstrated across Iran after the government Government increased gasoline prices by as much as 300 percent. Hundreds of people have been arrested. Hong Kong security chief has urged the remaining protesters hold up at a university to surrender. A few dozen hardcore demonstrators remained on campus several days after the latest protests began. Meanwhile, hundreds of protesters took over sidewalks in Hong Kong's central business district today. As David was mentioning moments ago in the U.K., Labor leader Jeremy Corbyn drew level with Prime Minister Boris Johnson in a crucial television debate. Corbyn effectively tied with Johnson in a snap poll on which candidate won the debate last night. He'd been trailing Johnson in personal approval scores. The candidates battled over trustworthiness, Brexit, and the National Health Service. About 150,000 customers in Northern California will have their power cut today. It's the newest attempt by PG&E to prevent further wildfires from igniting in the area, triggered by high winds. The latest in a series of planned outages has provoked widespread outage, triggering a state out outrage, excuse me, triggering a state investigation. There are growing calls for a government takeover of the bankrupt utility. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks very much, Mark. Coming up, we speak with a key member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Democrat Ben Cardin of Maryland, about the Hong Kong legislation that is working its way through Congress even as we speak. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The Senate unanimously passed legislation yesterday that would impose sanctions on Chinese officials committing human rights violations in Hong Kong and require annual review of Hong Kong's special trading status with the United States. Welcome now a key member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He is Democratic Senator from Maryland, Ben Cardin, who joins us from Capitol Hill. Senator, thank you so much for being back with us. Explain exactly what was driving the Senate, because it's rare that you get this kind of unanimity this quickly. 
Well, David, first, it's good to be with you, and you're exactly right. The Congress of the United States imposed a special status on Hong Kong uh, when it went under the control of China. But that was conditional upon the human rights and democracy of the people of Hong Kong being respected by the Chinese government. We've seen over the last 24 weeks with the protests taking place in Hong Kong, the Chinese government the violating South? that commitment. And now the, the Senate has acted, and we expect the House will do the same, to make it clear that if, if China does not respect the human rights and democracy of the people of Hong Kong, uh, that there will be sanctions imposed. Uh, and so we understand that the House of Representatives is scheduled to take this up on their side. I understand they had a different bill. You normally need to reconcile them. Maybe that won't be necessary. So how fast could this make it to the president's desk? Well, the conversations are taking place right now between the House and Senate. We are hopeful that the House will take up the Senate bill so it can go directly to the President of the United States. There's not much difference between the House and Senate bills. We want to get this to the President quickly. The protesters are being abused right now by the Chinese government. We think this can help. At the same time, this could absolutely complicate the relations with China over trade as they try to get this negotiation to so-called phase one. How does that figure in here? Should it be considered? Whenever we deal with China, it's going to be complicated, but we must wrap our relationship in American values, uh, universal values. You can't run away from what makes America the great nation it is, and that is standing up for human rights and democracy. So we can do both. We can work out the trade problems with China as well as we're, we're, we're making sure they comply with the commitment they gave to the people of Hong Kong. Do you hope, Senator Cardin, do you hope that actually China might change its policy toward Hong Kong because of this? Because obviously President Xi has been very adamant this is a matter of sovereignty for him. It's one nation, two systems. One nation. He emphasizes the one nation part. Well, it's one nation, two systems. And yes, we do expect China can, can change. But they did on the extradition law that they tried to pass that would have forced uh, people from Hong Kong to be tried under the Chinese system. They can change their practices into regards to the lawful protests by demonstrators to allow them to have basic freedom. So we expect China to live up to the commitment it made to the international community when the status of Hong Kong changed. There's another proceeding right now, even as we speak up on Capitol Hill, and that, of course, is the House impeachment proceeding, the public aspect of that. Uh, we've had Ambassador Sondland, who's been testifying throughout the day. Uh, what do you take from what's being said? Because it doesn't sound to me like he actually heard the president say there's a quid pro quo. Well, quite frankly, I'm, I'm pleased that as much of the facts as possible are getting out. These open hearings are critically important. It is very clear that they've connected the dots. That is, that the president wanted to have this investigation take place before the release of the funds or a visit to the White House by the president of Ukraine. I think that's pretty clear, uh, and I understand the testimony today reinforced that. Uh, Senator Cardin, the thing that gave rise to this entire incident is actually the importance, the strategic importance of Ukraine as an ally, and of course the incursions from Russia into eastern Ukraine. What do you make of our current foreign relations with Ukraine? How does Ukraine deal with us? How do we deal with Ukraine while these proceedings are going forward? Well, David, you're absolutely right. That's why there was such outrage in Congress when we heard the funds were being held up because we recognize that Ukraine is vulnerable and Russia is trying to compromise the independence of Ukraine, trying to prevent it from being, being uh, integrated into Europe. And th we needed to help them. And what was a great concern, Congress appropriated the money. Why was the administration holding off on those funds? And is this undermined, in your judgment, Ukraine's position with respect to Russia? Has it weakened their position with Russia because the relationship with the United States doesn't seem as solid as perhaps we would have liked it to have been? Well, absolutely, David. It plays into Russia's playbook, Putin's playbook. If we, in fact, are not living up to our bilateral understanding with Ukraine, it shows that Russia perhaps has some influence on what is happening in regards to the U.S. policy. So it played into Russia's playbook. Okay, Senator Cardin, finally, I want to return to something that I knew about some years ago called the Equal Rights Amendment, which was proposed back in the 70s, 60s and 70s, that didn't get ratified. You are an outspoken proponent of that. Why? 
Well, first of all, there has not been a constitution written since the end of World War II that doesn't contain an Equal Rights Amendment for women, and Americans would be surprised to learn it's not in our federal constitution. It was proposed back in the 1970s. 37 states have ratified. We need just one more. There's now a change in the political landscape in Virginia. It's very possible that Virginia will become the 38th state, which is what you need for ratification. Senator Murkowski, a Republican from Alaska, Ben Cardin, a Democrat from Maryland, have filed a resolution to remove the time limits. We hope that we can pass that. It's been marked up in the House. Uh, it's time that America again leads and shows that equal rights for women is embedded in our Constitution. Not to be too particular here, Senator, but explain one thing to me. Typically, the Bill of Rights protects minorities against majorities. Uh, in this instance, m women constitute the majority of the country, and they get to vote at the voting ba b ballot. So why do we need to have a constitutional amendment to protect them? We're still on that path of equality in regards to gender in this country. Uh, you're correct, the Bill of Rights, and this was discussed during the Bill of Rights and Equal Rights Amendment for Women. So it goes back a long time since the discussions first started in the voting rights. Remember, women did not have the voting rights uh, back when the Constitution was formed. So we're on that path. It makes a difference because of the legal tests in, in regards to discrimination. If it's in the Constitution, it's a higher standard. So today, we still don't have equal work, equal pay for equal work. We, we still have discriminations in our health care system. All of that would be, I think, improved for women in this country if we embedded in the Constitution of the United States equal rights. Okay, Senator Cardin, thank you so very much. It's always great to have you on. We really appreciate your time. That's Democratic Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland. Now we have some breaking news that's just gone across on a redhead on the Bloomberg that I find personally extraordinary. GM is suing Fiat Chrysler, alleging corruption undermined its UAW deals. They actually are filing racketeering charges. Now we knew that there were FBI investigations of the UAW's relationships with Ford particularly. This is a suit against Fiat Chrysler claiming that because of it its improper dealings with the UAW, apparently. It thinks it undermined GM's negotiating position when they just had this long strike. They lost over a billion dollars on it. Now they're suing them, and they want damages from Fiat Chrysler. We'll continue that story as it develops. In the meantime, this is Balance of Power. We are on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The 2020 Democratic primary is putting health insurance companies on notice. Candidates like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders have embraced Medicare for all. So I sat down with Cigna CEO David Cordani at the Economic Club of New York earlier today, and I asked him what it could mean for his industry. The single biggest risk from an industry standpoint is trying to preserve the status quo. It's proven that no player in this ecosystem, no matter what the scale is or capabilities, has a right to preserve the status quo. So the rate and change pace of innovation and the rate of change of constructive disintermediation of businesses needs to accelerate from that standpoint. And that's something that we at Cigna are seeking to do to ourselves in terms of disruptive innovation for the benefit of our customers and clients. We have some prominent candidates for uh, President of the United States on the Democratic side who are not interested in the status quo, I think it's fair to say. Yes. Uh, particularly talk about Medicare for all. Yes. Uh, I think what they're trying to accomplish there is both have broader care available to more Americans and have it more affordable. Uh, you talk about private-public partnership. Can you do it with public alone? So um, let's just frame a fact real quick. About 90% of Americans have access to um, affordable, constructed healthcare delivery systems today, whether it's through employer, Medicare, Medicaid, or exchange-based business. So there's about 90% of Americans that have access to programs today. I'm not saying they're perfect, but that's the fact set. Of the 10% that do not have access to programs today, about, that's about 30 million Americans, about a third of that group are Medicaid eligible, but their guardians do not sign them up for it. Another third of that group are eligible for either subsidized exchange or employer-sponsored opportunities, and about a third don't have requisite solutions. So there's still a gap that needs to be addressed. Bigger picture, um, we believe that the best system for the United States is a system based on choice, a system that embraces the highly personalized, localized healthcare, and a system that actually gets the best of public-private partnership doesn't go one way or the other. We don't believe, therefore, that a one-size-fits-all solution works from, from America.
And that was part of my interview earlier today with Cigna CEO David Cordani. That was at the Economic Club of New York. It's time now for the stock of the hour, a very different look at health, I dare say. Tobacco companies, Altria and Philip Morris, are both popping sharply higher on news U.S. regulators are hitting the brakes on a plan to reduce nicotine in cigarettes. Kaylee Lines is here to explain what's going on with these stocks, which are really moving. Yeah, they are moving. You saw a really sharp leg higher on this news. It's interesting. So the Department of Health and Human Services essentially tabling this plan that was announced two years ago to sharply cut uh, the amount of t uh, nicotine in cigarettes to non-addictive levels. This was a big initiative by the former FDA commissioner, Scott Gottlieb. He actually wanted to get nicotine levels down to near zero. Now, of course, that would have had a huge implication for tobacco companies. You could have seen a sharp drop off in tobacco sales once you remove the nicotine from that. So the fact that that is now lifted possibly as a possibility is providing a nice lift to these stocks, especially Altria, considering that smokable products, so putting aside its investments in cannabis and uh, vaping products, etc., its actual smokable products is still 90% of its revenue, so they're very reliant on cigarette sales here. But I wonder why the market move today actually doesn't <laughs> condemn the product, because it says basically, if you don't have high levels of nicotine that will addict you, then you won't sell as many cigarettes. Isn't that right. sort of really condemning with their own data? It is, and I think the companies, to be fair, already probably know that. I mean, you just look at the levels at which adult smoke is tapering off in the U.S. I mean, it's something like 66% of them wish they could quit, more than half of them wish they could try. So even if, okay, they get to leave the nicotine in, they're still likely going to see declining sales because this trend is just moving away from actual smokable tobacco products. Well, and you mentioned things like Juul and, and vaping and things. Uh, FDA is pulling back reportedly on this with respect to cigarettes. We earlier have seen that the FDA is not pooing ahead as fast as President Trump said they originally would in really curtailing the, the certain tastes injected into vaping products because of teenagers. Is this an overall move by the administration? It, it, it is possible. I mean, certainly the, the regulatory fears were kind of at a very elevated level back a few months ago, and those really do seem to have abated a bit. Now, in part, that's because of the likes of Juul actually have taken initiative on their own. They've decided they're going to stop selling a lot of those flavored products that, you know, were flagged by the FDA. They're now just going to focus on menthol and tobacco flavors. So maybe it's the initiative of the companies, but or this could signal an administration that's really pulling back on those efforts and focusing elsewhere. Reported because of politics, potentially, but also we have the issue of state. Now, California and New York have sued Juul over their marketing practices. Yeah, and it's really interesting. I mean, especially when we're talking about nicotine, a lot of the yeah. uh, co complaint that has been about Juul is that it's kind of a gateway, potentially, for pe young users, especially, who don't necessarily smoke cigarettes, gets them addicted to nicotine because there is still nicotine in those products, and then they would eventually go on to smoke nicotine cigarettes. Exactly, especially teenagers. Exactly. exactly. Terrific report. Thank you so much to Kaylee Lines. Still ahead here, the promise of a sustainable path forward. Uh, the IMF is responding to President elect Alberto Fernandez plan to get Argentina back on track. We discuss with a key IM official coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. From New York, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Alberto Fernandez has a plan for Argentina. That's what the president-elect told the IMF in his first phone call with the new managing director as he works to renegotiate the country's record $56 billion credit line. Fernandez vowed to tackle the nation's debt problem while spurring growth, but ruled out any austerity measures in a future deal. For the latest on these negotiations, we welcome now Alejandro Werner. He is IMF director of the Western Hemisphere Department. Thank you so much for being here, Alejandro. Oh, thank you for having me. So give us, uh, bring us up to date on exactly where we are with Argentina at the moment. There is this large credit line, yeah. but we have a new government, and we heard Ms. Georgova basically said, we're eager to hear what your plan is. When do we get it? Exactly. So, so we had a, a very large program with Argentina. From those $57 billion that you mentioned, 44 have been disbursed. And then given market volatility uh, and the, uh, the new government that was elected uh, recently, uh, we have been in talks with the current government. We're expecting eventually to, to see uh, the program by the new government and be able to engage with them with uh, the objective of basically helping Argentina in their design of their new program to bring Argentina back to growth, to bring inflation back. Inflation in Argentina might end up being 57% this year, and that has been a big driver of the increase in poverty. So it will be very important for Argentina to have a comprehensive program that helps bring down inflation, uh, jumpstart uh, growth, 
and therefore significantly improve poverty that has worsened a lot. And the magic words, as I understand it, are debt sustainability. Do you have yeah. a plan basically that's sustainable over the longer term? Is that possible without austerity as a practical matter? Do they need to come closer to balancing their budget? Look, as I, as, uh, I have been saying, what we need to see is the whole plan it, it, in its integrity. It's very hard just to talk about government expenditure or taxes or a debt level if you don't put anything together. So in a sense, uh, we're waiting to engage with the government. Uh, debt has increased a lot, and that's why uh, there has been this big talk about uh, these big debt operations that we have to be undertaking. But we will wait un until we see the whole plan to see if the plan actually is consistent, if their fiscal policy is consistent with the debt levels that they will have, let's say, five years down the road. Two last questions, RJ, before we move more yeah. broadly to the region. Number one, do you have any idea of when you'll be able to sit down and look at the plan and negotiate with them? And uh, number two, who's going to be on this side of the table? Do you know who the officials yeah. will be responsible for this? The second one is easier because the answer is no. But obviously, I mean, the team that has been helping President Fernandez to draw his economic program, we have met with them uh, in a few occasions, but we don't know exactly what will be the final cabinet and, and an economic team. Secondly, I mean, yesterday in the call between President-elect Fernandez and our managing director, I think both sides expressed uh, their eagerness right. to start working relatively soon. And obviously, we, we are ready. We have our teams uh, working on this and looking at different scenarios, so we're ready to engage when Argentina deems uh, suitable. We were talking with Alejandro Werner. He is IMF director of the Western Hemisphere Department. So let's talk more broadly about the region, because we see uh, uh, really uh, political unrest in Santiago, Chile, in Ecuador, in La Paz, Bolivia. Is there a common cause for that? Is there a pattern through Latin America? I mean, there, there's obviously very idiosyncratic elements in each case, no? because you have, on the one side, one of the most developed nations in Latin America, that is Chile, that has had an average growth rate for the last uh, 30 years that has been the, one of the highest in the region, basically showing strains in the equilibrium between social development and growth. And I think what we're seeing is that the population is also uh, uh, looking for a growth model that is more inclusive mm -hmm. than the one it has and to focus on those, on those elements. In, in Bolivia, you have a, basically a situation that is much more associated with electoral issues uh, than anything else, an economy that has done well, mm -hmm. and it's looking at some uh, uh, macroeconomic disequilibrium that has developed right. as a product of the decline in the price of gasoline. Right. And in Ecuador, what you have is a government that is trying to implement policies to correct significant macroeconomic imbalances. Ecuador is a big oil exporter. When the, when the price of oil collapsed, Ecuador postponed the correction of the big deficits, both external and domestic and fiscal, that developed. The current government is trying to rebalance policies so they, they, they hold and they stop the increase in debt. And obviously, in doing so, it has created some tensions. Well, and, I, I, and that's what we have seen in the street. As a senior official of the IMF, how do you avoid becoming the bad boy? Uh, the, the, because we see that to some extent yeah. in Ecuador, we've seen in other places around the world that as governments try to get their house in order, their economic house in order, the IMF sometimes gets blamed. How do you avoid becoming an influence for the negative? I think uh, you're right, and, and it's very important for us, given that when we come in into a country with financial support, it's always in very difficult times, that we always have to have a very important focus on protecting the poorest of society, mm -hmm. on protecting those that have less access to financial resources, uh, to, to the labor market, etc. And, and the, the, the programs that we help the countries design should have a very important focus on protecting the poor. And that's what the Ecuadorian government mm -hmm. is trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also have to have a, a flexibility to adjust to changing circumstances. So now in, in Ecuador, I mean, recently they went to, to the National Assembly with a big legislative pro project right. that was rejected. And now the government is basically trying a different strategy yeah. to discuss each of the initiatives yeah. separately. I think we need to work with them yeah. to try to feed into our programs a, a, the, the big idea of that, what they want to accomplish when circumstances change 
But when there is a very strong commitment and the government continues to move <laughs> forward in implementing the thrust yep. of their policy package. You have a lot on your plate, I think it's fair to say. Many thanks to Alejandro Werner. He is IMF Director of the Western Hemisphere Department. For Bloomberg First Word News, we're going to turn now to Mark Crumpton. David, during impeachment hearings today, U.S. Ambassador to the European Union Gordon Sundland said a meeting between President Trump and Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky at the White House was put on hold, but that that meeting came with strings attached. Johnny's requests were a quid pro quo for arranging a White House visit for President Zelensky. Mr. Giuliani demanded that Ukraine make a public statement announcing the investigations of the 2016 election, DNC server, and Burisma. Mr. Giuliani was expressing the desires of the President of the United States, and we knew these investigations were important to the President. Ambassador Sondland said he voiced his concerns to Vice President Pence about the holdup of military aid and says Secretary of State Mike Pompeo also knew what was going on. The Democratic presidential debates will resume tonight with a new pecking order on display. Pete Buttigieg is set to take the stage in Atlanta as the emerging frontrunner in Iowa. His nine percentage point lead over the pack in Iowa is a sign of strength for the party's moderates. The choice of venue is also a sign of Democrats' hopes to put Georgia in play in 2020 and a pickup opportunity for two Senate seats. The UK is accusing China of torturing a former employee of the British consulate in Hong Kong. Simon Chung, a Hong Kong resident who worked for the consulate, went missing for 15 days in August while on the mainland. Chung alleges he was beaten by Chinese agents who forced him who forced him for information on the ongoing protests in Hong Kong. The accusation further damages relations between the two countries amid London's support for pro-democracy protesters in its former colony. Bloomberg's learned that a trade deal that fell apart six months ago is being used as the benchmark in U.S.-China negotiations. The key provision, how much tariffs should be rolled back in the first phase of an agreement. The two sides may link the size of rollbacks to the preliminary terms of that failed deal. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. Up next, we hear from the CEO of Volkswagen of America. That's coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, when it comes to automobiles, it's all about electric vehicles these days, including at the L.A. Auto Show, where Volkswagen of America CEO Scott Keogh joined me from earlier today, and I asked him about what news his company is making out there. Behind me, of course, is what I call today's vehicle. This is the Atlas Cross Sport. It's the fastest-growing segment in the, uh, in the market. Uh, this vehicle is being ramped up in Chattanooga as we speak, come to the marketplace in February, and frankly, we couldn't be more excited to uh, enter this segment. Five-seat SUV, $33,000, great car. Also behind me is the uh, Space Vision. It's a vehicle we unveiled last night. And frankly, this will be our third EV that we will launch in the U.S. market. And to me, it does a lot of what Americans want. Has a lot of space, has a lot of versatility, has great ride height. And of course, super aerodynamics. You know, that's what you need to deliver a vehicle with 300 miles of range. So we have a lot going on at Volkswagen. So tell us about the strategy on the electric vehicle side of this, because all the talk with all the auto companies about, is about EVs. Uh, exactly where are we right now in the percentage of the fleet that is electric, and what are your projections over the next three to four years? Yeah. You know, look, right now, if you look at the market, it's approximately 2% of the market. So as you can see, if the market's 17 million, 2% of the cars uh, is, uh, is not huge numbers. But where we see it going, and if you look at most industry analysts, they say somewhere between 10 and 15% by 2025. If you look at our sales and what we're projecting, it's exactly that. About 15 to 16% of our sales will be coming from EVs. To me, it's quite simplistic. There is going to be a revolution. There is going to be this new wave coming. And when you have that, you want to position yourselves at the front of the line. So that's what we're doing. That's why we're readying three cars. 
That's why, of course, we did the brown groundbreaking for our factory in, uh, in Chattanooga last week. We want to get in the front of the line. It's as simple as that. And what sorts of cars will the first the edge of the wedge be for Volkswagen? We just saw Ford announce their Mustang Mach-E. They're going with a hybrid cross, crossover. So what are you doing? Look, I think we have some similar research. Uh, our first vehicle will be a what we call an A-segment SUV, so we're similar size to the product that you mentioned. This will be a car that we'll be importing uh, next year, so it'll be coming at the end of next year. That'll be the first vehicle. The second vehicle, of course, will be the mythical ID Buzz, you know, a car that takes you back to the glory days of the Volkswagen bus. And then the third vehicle is the one behind me. And the one behind me is fully tuned for aerodynamics. It's a large vehicle. It's a C or DC size vehicle that gets almost 300 miles of range. But of course, you know, the great thing for us, David, is we have this MEB architecture. This is a platform that's going to be making nearly 20 million cars worldwide. That gives us huge scaling effects, huge economy of scales. And it's a platform that's flexible. It can make something as extreme as a buggy uh, or something like the car you see behind me. So this is a massive competitive advantage for, uh, for Volkswagen, one obviously we want to take advantage of. Volkswagen has some fairly aggressive projections by 2025 about how many models you're going to have that are both electric but also hybrid, uh, but also what percentage of your sales will be attributed to those. Where will those vehicles be made? We have eight plants uh, across the world. So again, something we're ramping up quite aggressively. You know there was a uh, opening just a few weeks ago, the ID3, the first MEB car came off the plant in Zwickau. But of course, we are doing our groundbreaking in, uh, in Chattanooga, in Tennessee. The first car will come off the line in 2022. But across the entire network, eight plants are being electrified as we speak. This is the largest commitment of any manufacturer from China to Europe to, of course, here in the United States. We're talking with Scott Keogh. He is the president of Volkswagen America. So, Scott, as you look at the electric vehicle world uh, around the world, how much of this is being driven by tri China and how much is being driven by subsidies from governments? You know, this is a fair thing that comes up. And I know there's a fair amount of cynicism to say, is this a consumer-led revolution? Is it a political-led revolution? It is a conspiracy of sorts uh, started by, you know, environmental and climatists. Frankly, at the end of the day, I see this thing, when the dust all settles, being consumer-led. The reason I see it being consumer-led is these products are going to be extremely cool. They're going to be quick. They're going to be fast. They're going to give you great range. And at the end of the day, I always focus on the consumer. So when I look specifically for us in America, there's two data points I look at. We did research two years ago, showed consumers our entire electric fleet, and we got a market reaction. We did that same test, same cars, modifications, and the market basically doubled to tripled in terms of people intending to buy. So we see the wave coming. The other one, of course, was last week. We had 900 of our dealers uh, down in Chattanooga. And whether it's in Milwaukee or whether it's in Santa Monica, California, dealers see it as a business opportunity. So they're saying, let's bring it and let's go. So my reaction from consumers and from dealers is, uh, is the wave is just starting to hit right now. And, and again, we will be there. So, so, Scott, you talk about that uh, wave coming and the consumer driving it. Might that give more force behind the demand for vehicles overall? Because there's some softness in the United States right now. Certainly in China, you're seeing softness. Is this a possible renewal of the demand? People going and saying, you know what, I'm electric. I want to replace my car because I want an electric vehicle. You know, David, that is a, a key insight and something I see as well. If you look at the average age of a vehicle on the roads in the U.S., it's about 11 to 12 years. This has a massive opportunity to drive an entirely new stimulus. And I think that stimulus will hit when you get the pricing right, of course, when you get the value story in terms of uh, uh, lifestyle uh, and life cycle ownership, it's going to lead to a massive refreshing. Because right now, if you want to refresh your car, the customer is saying, ah, a new one has one or two miles per gallon. Maybe it has nicer leather. When someone says a new one, fully connected, all electric, a whole new world of driving, I think it has a massive opportunity to do a reset. That's what I see as well. I think that'll be two to three years out when more of these cars get on the road and you get what I call purchase confirmation. The biggest driver of sales is another consumer seeing another one on the road and saying, ah, the Joneses have one, the Smiths have one. I want to get in on it. So it's a massive opportunity. One, honestly, I think we should take full advantage of being an American and being here in the U.S. market. So and that was my interview with Volkswagen of America CEO Scott Keogh. Up next, we're going to have more on cars, including the new GM Fiat Chrysler lawsuit. This is Balance of Power. We're on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
This is Blunt Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. GM is suing Fiat Chrysler for racketeering, alleging corruption at the company contaminated its deals with the UAW. For more, let's welcome now Bloomberg News automotive reporter Craig Trudell. So I must say this just broke while I've been on the air. It's got my attention. This is wild. I mean, th this is shaking Detroit to its core. Uh, it's hard to sort of uh, overstate the significance of this. Uh, this is this all it has been sort of swirling this idea of corruption uh, with the United Auto Workers Union, where we've seen the feds come after uh, some of the highest level uh, well, the, the, leaders the FBI of the UAW. Raided the home of the UAW leader because the, of Ford yeah. UAW allegations of corruption. Well, and it was yes. So so the president of of the union uh, the the former president of the union. Uh, it's been uh, Fiat Chrysler and GM officials uh, within the union, uh, also some executives within Fiat Chrysler. Uh, all along, uh, Fiat Chrysler and the UAW uh, have, have tried to uh, sort of downplay the extent to which this corruption uh, you know, clouded the con past contracts uh, that they negotiated. Uh, but this strikes at the heart of that argument. This says that Sergio Marchione himself uh, was involved in authorizing bribes to uh, basically uh, weaken GM and sort of right. force Mary Barra's hand to merge with. Well, see, with that's the a fascinating thing. Besides the just corruption, of course, Mr. Racchioni sadly has passed away, so he's not around to defend himself. Right. But the allegation goes beyond you were just trying to get our labor costs up. It's saying when Sergio Marchioni says you got to merge with me, GM, and Mary Barra said no, thank you very much, that he tried to weaken Mary Barra's hand to force him to merge. That's even a larger story. And we remember, I mean, this was playing out very publicly, where Marchioni was not a shy man. He was uh, very <laughs> open uh, about all, all things, in, including uh, merging with GM. And he talked about, uh, you know, really wanting Mary Barra to come to the table. It, he was very sort of unusual in that sense that he wasn't shy about talking openly about uh, merging. And, and this was a huge issue for him. He pushed the idea that the industry really needed to consolidate, uh, that it made sense for GM and Fiat Chrysler to come together. And what uh, GM is alleging here is that he tried to use union negotiations and sort of, uh, you, you know, uh, really, uh, you know, uh, screw up the, the contracts and, and put GM in a weaker position. And the markets are reacting, actually. Fiat Chrysler stock is down almost 5%. GM stock is up a bit, actually. So it's interesting they're reacting. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Craig Trudell. We always turn to him on automobiles. Peter Georgescu saw the worst of socialism when he was separated from his parents with the fall of the Iron Curtain. And he did forced labor as a young child as well as indoctrination at communist camps. Before, President Eisenhower arranged for him to be reunited with his parents as part of a spy swap. He went on to Princeton and Stanford Business School, ultimately rising to the top of the advertising giant Young and Rubicam. Now he's concerned that capitalism is not doing all it can for society and the government must be confined to the constructive but limited role it has to play. Government cannot provide the, the rules and the guidance in the entrepreneurial spirit of corporations. Government, however, must have the guide, guideposts. They must have regulations. I'm 100% behind that. But in fact, it isn't, the government cannot legislate justness. Business must really accept, capitalism must adopt justness and fairness and must produce the great work and the great results. Capitalists can do that. History is replete with examples when governments wanted to take over. That's what socialism was about. And communism was really socialism. Forget the ideology of Marx, it was socialism. They really controlled the means of production and so forth. And it has failed. It's been tried across even Scandinavia and so forth. They went away for it. The Scandinavians are not socialists, they're capitalists in reality with a very strong and robust, if you will, support system. They do that, but it's not socialism. We must allow capitalism to thrive at its best. We need capitalism. We're not going to compete with China by having the government run businesses. We're going to die. But, but that's one of the interesting questions, because some people right now are saying China is a different model. It is. Uh, that they have a form of capitalism when it comes to the economy, but they are not free with the rights, human rights, and rights to speak out and things like that. Is it possible it actually is a better model than ours? It's a different model than ours, and it's going to work for them for a long time. But sooner or later, I think they're going to run into problems. But in the meantime, they're going to eat our lunch if we don't change.
That was part of my conversation with Peter Georgescu. You can catch the full interview with him on Big Decisions. That's airing tonight for the first time at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We have a headline now just crossing the wire. Israel's Benny Gantz reportedly has failed to form a government. So once again, Israel's tried to put a government together and has come up short. Coming up on Balance of Power, we're going to have a second hour on Bloomberg Radio talking about that Hong Kong legislation. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.